Great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected. Only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASEC certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing, nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hello again. Hi. Um, so here we sit, continuing our hot guesting hot summer, guest summer, and not video recording ourselves because that's hard to do without our house around us. We continue the journey of um, wandering amongst our backyard properties mm. in intense. We're just, we're itinerant It's very intense. This point. We're itinerant oh, yes, podcasters very intense. right now. It's very, oh, in multiple sorry. Tents. Intense. Okay. Yeah, sorry. All right, that. so that's out there now. <laughs> okay. But hot guesting summer's been amazing because I thought that this summer, originally, before there was all this building, I thought we would spend this summer creating some episodes that helped people understand that there are a lot of ways to do open relating because we're right. shifting gears and we're really focusing in what and helping people understand that opening your relationship doesn't have to look one way that there are so many ways to do that including opening it in lots of ways and still maintaining exclusivity in some ways right which is a less commonly it's like we don't one think of the that. more creative solutions and so approaches. i thought we'd be doing that ourselves yeah and instead um well we needed a little we needed some some help so i reached out to my community and got in touch with some of my favorite speakers. Um, and Kate Laurie, oh, I mean, yeah, we, had we a, lucked out this time. We did. We lucked <laughs> okay, out. Okay, this summer's been filled with amazing guests. But right now, Kate's popping. And the, and the reason why is because Kate recently released a book called, titled Open Deeply. Um, and it's magnificent. It's wonderful. <laughs> Open Get Deeply it is it. a guide for building conscious, compassionate, open relationships, right? So... If you've been listening to our podcast, you're probably thinking, uh, isn't that the thing you talk about? Yeah, guess what? There are lots there's, of us. And there's lots of us and there's so many, there's so much to talk about. So if you're feeling like the topics Ken and I talk about are off the wall, or it feels like you love our advice, but you feel like, okay, but aren't I going to be lonely in my world? Um... Yeah, there's actually a lot of us out there. There's a lot. Recent studies have shown that, you know, 5% of people at least, and those are just the ones who admit to it, are in open relationships. 20% um, have tried it at some point. And really recently, 33 to 44% of millennial and Gen X generations um, 
are open to it, are open to being open. So you're not alone, and there are resources being created for you right now. And this, uh, yeah, and so Kate Laurie is one of those resources. She's created the resources and continues to create. And the conversation we had was, um, it was, I, it was great. It, it was so, there was so much to it. And I found that um, thinking about, hearing her talk about how she thinks about how to think about polyamory and how to deal with it um, was, 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 a, well, it was mind opening for me. Like, right. oh, here's another, I'm, I'm for in decades. it. Yep. And here's somebody else's approach to it. And there's so much to learn. Right. I, so Kate is specifically, she's a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I think that that, um, that difference between, so I'm a, I'm a depth psychologist and the MFT degree is a different, it's a different mode of working with the world. And I love that because all these different perspectives that people bring, if you go back and listen to more of the guesting episodes here too, there are all of these different perspectives people bring. And that's because adults... You know, we, we just have these lives and then we filter our new experiences through our past experiences more often than not. And that's great because it leads us to problem solve in different ways. It leads us to understand that variety really can be the most thriving option. Mm -hmm. um, so Kate's, Kate's also been up to her elbows in people's relationships for a long time. She's seen the messes. And that's something else that I think can't be stressed highly enough. I, I say it, but let me say it again. Um, polyamory is not better than monogamy. And it's not, one isn't neater than the other. Monogamy is not neater or cleaner or easier than polyamory. Relationships are messy. They really are. And sometimes we need outside help or an outside um an outside support, but sometimes we also just need to hear other perspectives on how someone might approach a particular problem. And by doing that, we break open the the log jam in our own mind that creates the stuckness that we feel. Right. Like, yeah. oh, I, I can't bring this topic up with my partner, or I can't figure out how to negotiate this these seemingly incompatible needs and desires. Often all we need is to hear a conversation like this and yeah. remember that we're all out here doing this in different yeah. ways. Relationships are messy because we're messy, each individually, each in our own way. And when when we bump up against somebody else or, you know, lean up against somebody else and say, here's my mess, and they say, here's my mess, you got a mess. But it's the mess of connection. Oh. And so then... Say that again. Yeah, right? It, it is the mess of connection. It, that's It's not simple when, when you have tied yourself to somebody else even just in a conversation all of a sudden your world's more complicated yeah thank goodness right yeah I you get diversity <laughs> you get color you get all these these things and that's what i loved about this conversation was listening to kate talk about things from her perspective right and all of a sudden all of my perspectives were a little bit different yeah, it was right. great. Now you have a new lens, a new way to yeah. look and frame things. And um, so I want to just stress to everyone, if you are opening, opening, open deeply, Kate's book is one of my top three recommendations. It's generally, depending on where people are right now, I have three books that I recommend um, that people will start with. And it's it's one of my top reads. And that goes for even if you're not sure whether you're opening up or not. Because bottom line open relationship skills are just good relationship skills. Yeah. That's what they are. And and so whether you choose to open all the things, some of the things, or whether you go on a wander through this adventure and find out that monogamy is the right fit for you, understanding how relationships and how different people do relationships, that that just helps. That helps across the board. I still read books from a monogamous perspective, and they help my relationship. And vice versa is sure. true. So yeah. I think it's just important to have said that. And because I really do think that this is one of those bookshelf, bookshelf books. Like this is one I bought copies for other people. I think it's a good one to have on your shelf. Go grab it. And before you do that, though, listen to this conversation. Yes. Hear what Kate's got to say. Um, Kate Laurie 
is a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist. She's a sex positive um, person who also is has this amazing set of specialties. She's not non-monogamous. She's got kink specialties, LGBTQ specialties, and sex worker um, friendly communities. She she is really she's deeply invested in sex positive therapy for people. I love that about her. Um, she's also the author of Open Deeply, a guide to building conscious compassionate, open relationships. She co-hosts her own sex-positive podcast, Open Deeply, with Sunny Megatron, another fabulous human being. Um, And Kate's been featured in BuzzFeed videos and has been guest on Playboy Radio and many podcasts, including Sex with Dr. Jess, um, American Sex, Sluts and Scholars, and Multiamory. She's written for Good Vibrations and Hollywood Magazine, and she's a frequent public speaker. Her private practice is in Encino, and really, this is a conversation. Listen for the to this books. conversation, get her book, and then see how it applies to you, and let us know what you think. Yes, I think please. this one in particular yeah. might shift your perspective on something. I'd so love to hear. You can always take on reach it. out to us. You'll find us at um, Jolie, Ham- Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us. It is genuinely a pleasure to talk to you. I'm, and I'm really excited to make sure that we talk to you about the book, but, but also I'm just excited to share space with you for a little while. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. And, and I feel honored to come on, you know, I mean, I think you're putting out uh, wonderful information into the world. So I, I love to connect with anybody who is uh, fighting to create a more sex positive, shame free world and and doing the good work, especially these days when uh, our culture is so suppressive. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Mm. So, Kat and I have this podcast, and one of the things that we do is we talk to guests who contrib- they're contributing something to the field of relationships and sexuality. But you are particularly spot on for our listenership because you are the author of Open Deeply. And so, I mean, I would love for you to just tell us right off the bat, tell us about the book and specifically, why did you write it? Like, why does it exist at all? Writing books of pain. (laughs) It's a lot of work. (laughs) Yeah. And it took me five years to do it. I did. Yeah. Which is a whole thing that I could speak on, but um, there's many reasons why I wrote open deeply. Um, One thing was just people would come into my practice and they had already read the ethical slot. They had already read opening up. My clients are super bright and they, but they still felt lost. And so um, I I wrote a book that touched on the things that I heard on a loop inside and outside of my practice. The vignettes are, uh, you know, conglomerations uh, of different things I've heard from different people rather than an example of a particular couple or what have you. Um, So so there was that aspect. Um, And uh, the other thing in how I wrote it, I did try and do a lot of vignettes because what I saw in my practice is that if I introduce a concept, a lot of times the look I would see on the person's face with the scrunchy face, but you know, the little the (laughs) little little scrunchy between (laughs) between the eyebrows. And as soon as I gave an example, then it was like, oh, so all through the book, I try and give examples of like how things could go wrong or how things can go better and you know, and try and make things really crystal clear. Um, you know, also, so I'm 53. I started being non-monogamous about in 2003 ish. So, you know, almost 20 years, uh, back then when I first switched, I had had an 11 year monogamous relationship and I switched to having a non-monogamous relationship. And I wasn't even aware of the ethical slut that was put out, I think in 98. Um, and so a lot of our journey, we had to learn the hard way. And so I also wrote the book um, to try and create a model uh, that would help people avoid that. So they don't have to learn the hard way. Uh, uh, You know, a third, you know, another thing that I've seen is that a lot of books don't address the fact that a lot of times people are coming into a relationship model, whether it's non-monogamous or monogamous. And there's other things going on, like maybe they're struggling with a mood disorder, or maybe they're dating a narcissist, you know, and like, so I tried to address those things, like how does that impact your non-monogamous journey? And then, I mean, finally, I know I'm being long-winded. I apologize. No, it's good. It's good. And finally, you know, uh, 
when when polysecure came out in the middle of me writing my book i was like oh no you know because it's <laughs> because it's 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 about uh, a lot of the things i touch on but when i read it i was i actually had the opposite reaction where i'm like oh this is actually like the gateway book that really just feeds into my book yes you know um, that is completely or- how i read them and how i actually suggest them to people as well that's when i'm when i'm sort of prescribing them as as an order of operations i find that you picked up in many places and you went deeply into some things that i don't think anybody else has really addressed things like dating a narcissist i haven't seen anybody take that on so kudos to you for being willing to go there, like go into the, those shadowy areas. Cause we're complicated people. Like, <laughs> yeah, nobody's, and, and, nobody's doing this in a vacuum. There's always stuff going on. Right. It's way more complicated than yeah. just being non-monogamous, you know, and, and um, you know, and you can read my book unto itself. It could be your fir- first book to read, but you know, it does do a really big deep dive and you know in in talking about narcissism that's another thing that i have a little bit of a beef with is that a lot of times when uh educators are are talking it it almost feels like they're assuming that you have a benevolent and kind partner and then the information proceeds from there when you know there's a lot of folks that are blessed with benevolent and kind partners um but then there's a lot of folks that have you know, the, let's face it, um, the non, non-monogamy can be a narcissistic fuel source, you know, like Absolutely. if you see, yeah, like if you see Trump at a Trump bat rally, his, all those people that are revering him, you know, is his narcissistic supply source. And he's just, it's like, he's shooting up. Right. Right. And so within non-monogamy, the narcissistic supply could potentially be other amazing lovers and stuff. So they tend to choose an over giver that they can railroad that kind of thing. And so, you know, to me, that was something that was important to address head on. And I think, you know, it was kind of nice that open by Rachel Krantz came out almost simultaneously with my book. And again, her book and my book, dovetail so nicely right thank goodness more people are putting their stories into there because I one thing I really liked about yours is that you introduce your background like you're clear like this you are both researcher (laughs) therapist instrument and and a person like you really humanize it um and Rachel does the same thing there's this and depth of um just a, a courageousness to say it's not always neat and pretty I and mean, even my journey wasn't neat and pretty. And Ken and I talk about that For sure. quite a bit. That's, it was not true. neat or pretty. It's yeah. practically a miracle that we wound up together after how we started. And yet, in my experience, that's more frequently the case. And so writing a book that has this, all this shadowy stuff, all this stuff that we'd rather pretend like, oh, everybody will just be, you know, well-adjusted, able to self-regulate. And right. That's just not reality. And I don't think we should gatekeep um, any kind of relationships to the point where we're like, oh, all those people don't deserve them. It, you know, when, we, when we're like all the people who have any other things going on, ugh, like what, what is yeah. that for our world? That doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah. I might not want to be in relationship with a narcissist. I also don't want to be the kind of person who says that there's no recovery possible fr- from that, you know, that, or that there's no functional relationship. It, it's not for me to decide. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, with with narcissism, especially when you're dealing with kind of a baby narcissist or someone who's not diagnosable. Yeah, yeah, you there is room to make that a healthier relationship when when, the more extreme with the narcissism, as you know, it becomes ego syntonic, like they don't think there's anything wrong with them. And they're never going to go to therapy unless they feel like they can hoodwink the therapist into being complicit with their agenda, you know, but um, with folks that are more baby narcissists or or just have symptoms and then yeah, right. Especially just that like tinge or the or the narcissistically wounded, they're just like, like they're, they have that tinge. And then I just find that if we never talk about it, we don't learn to differentiate. It's not all or it's not just like, oh, we check a box and, and put people over into that into that box or this box, which is it really, really needs a clinical diagnosis. Dehumanizing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 We want to mm-hmm. avoid that. And, and certainly everybody's accusing everybody of gaslighting right now. And like all of this, 
all this stuff. And, you know, some people might think when they hear me talking about this, you know, like if, if a monogamous person was listening, they might go, well, see, this is exactly what I thought. These people are struggling. And it's just like all the stuff that I talk about in, in open deeply regarding non-monogamy, I have also seen within monogamous relationships. And oh, by the way, a lot of that stuff can just run dormant in a monogamous relationship because it doesn't poke at your attachment injury. So you can think that you're emotionally healthier than you are. Yep. That's what because, I found. Yeah. That's what I found. I, I was, and both of us in our yeah. first marriages, mm-hmm. both of us felt very clearly that we, we had a handle on things, certain things that non-monogamy exposed. And I don't even right. actually By mean avoiding the, the situations right. that would bring up those particular emotional confusions or whatever in me, then yeah, sure. I can feel really good about how things are going because I've stayed away from all the things that cause trouble. You right. Right. But that means that I can't, me in particular, it means that I don't grow into those places and find out what else there is of me that's lying dormant. Cause it's not just those emotional, you know, the, the feelings it's, it's parts of me that I just sh- shut off because I can't use them here. Yeah. Figure out what to do with them and how to work with them. And all of a sudden there's more of me. 110%. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is, you know, again, if someone monogamous was looking in or even a therapist that looks through a monogamous lens, they might think, okay, well, if you have borderline symptoms, you can't be non-monogamous or, or certainly if you have DID, you can't be non-monogamous and, and, like with the DID, I mean, obviously that is in most cases, probably that would be maybe too much, you know, they would have to have a very simple form of non-monogamy, but honestly, one of the healthiest non-monogamous relationships I'm aware of actually one person has DID and you would never think that that would be a thing, that that would be something that's possible, but this is a relationship that's gone on for decades with two other partners, you know? And, uh, I love that. And I just love that you're having a conversation because it, I think so much of what's being written right now has, it's, it's about the entry into, and I often tend to be a person who's working with people who are leaving monogamy, entering into non-monogamy and you, what you're talking about just keeps the work going it on and on like deeper and deeper layers of, of how relation, how you can look at relationships, how relationships can be your growth, your, your path. I'm hearing, I'm hearing you say that there's the potential for people to be in multiple relationships from really any place that they're starting there. It doesn't, it's not just one path in, it's not just the simplest, um, easiest to get along with folks, but also that it's going to be effort, that it's going to be effortful. Right. You know, and, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think there is certain things that certain, if we're creating a little cake batter that creates a, a, a better, um, outcome, uh, again, as I talk about in the book, one of the things is compassion, like having compassion, not just for other, other partners, but compassion for yourself. As soon as you are avoiding either compassion for others or yourself, um, you're non-monogamous. Well, any relationship model is probably not sustainable or, or it's going to be damaging. Yeah. You, know? you, yeah. You say something right. Um, about compassion that I thought was, you gave a vignette that I thought was particularly poignant. Um, and in the vignette, one of the partners had um, had flubbed on 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 following up with the agreements that they were supposed to be keeping. They were at a party and they'd separated, and she forgot to do the check in. And then her partner and the thing that you said that I thought was just so spot on for any relationship was to to remind the the other partner, the partner who was quote unquote wronged, because they were that they're going to mess up at some point too. And they're going to want compassion. They're going to want their partner to be able to hold some compassion for them because I think seeking perfection is just so common in non-monogamy, or at least I see a lot of people seeking perfection where there is none. I I would love Mm -hmm. to hear you say a little bit about, about compassion, like take that deeper. What can, what do you see people, people's opportunity there? Yeah, well, I mean, like with that example, um, so often, you know, when one person feels wronged, and maybe they're new at non monogamy, so often they get on their high horse, and they want to have the rage, and they want to like, you know, really go off on their partner. And, you know, I, I do slow down and slow them down and and say, I can promise you that you're going to mess up at some point. (laughs) 
Yeah. And, and I can promise you that you would, you would want that compassion in that moment, you know, so really think this through in terms of how you want to engage right now. Right. Um, because it will impact your future. Because if you are just, even when your partner is trying to make amends and you are just coming at them with rage down the road, when you mess up and you ask for compassion, they're going to be like, now, why should I do that? Given how you responded to me when I had a, a mess up a while back, you know, so you have to be really careful with that. Yeah. Um, I find that a lot of times people don't have compassion for themselves. You know, they um, have this whole, they've listened to a, a lot of information about say polyamory and they've gotten this idea of how it should be done. Like in a, almost like as if non-monogamy is dogmatic, which right. is strange because I mean, here we are, we, a lot of us, we've switched to non-monogamy because we do love freedom, carefree, fun, and adventure. And yet, you know, and we want to steer away from monogamy that can be, it can feel so controlling. Right. And then so many factions of non-monogamy has become just as dogmatic. Right. You know, right. and, and so you, you have these people that are, that are in my office in the shame spiral saying, you know, I, I'm not good at polyamory or whatever. And they're in this complete, like no self-compassion. Yeah. Yeah. That came up in my, in my, so I do academic research on jealousy specifically. And when I interview polyamorous people, one of the most common themes that popped up was this myth of the good poly person. And that was the biggest block that turned up in that particular study. The biggest block to really working productively with jealousy was that they, if a person had internalized the idea that good poly people weren't jealous, that became the, the biggest block. So it was the dogmatic behavior, not the actual jealousy. Once they broke through that myth of, oh, actually I can be jealous and I can be good at this. I can practice good habits. I can, I can learn how to work with this. As soon as they could break that myth, there was then something to do, but some of them s reported, you know, years of really struggling with that, that good poly person they were supposed to be, especially yeah. if it was enhanced by say having one particular partner or one particular guru that they were following, who was sort of outlining like what polyamory or what open relating is. I, right. I'm wondering if you have anything to say about like how we talk about this as a, as a larger community and well, I think there's people that you can talk to and then people who you can't talk to because they don't want to hear it. You mm. know, like there are some people that are just down the dogmatic rabbit hole and they, they don't want to hear uh, anything that's outside of their bubble. But then there's plenty of people. I've, I've had so many people in my private practice say, I want to join the Facebook, you know, like Facebook uh, non-monogamous groups. But when I do, like if you say something that's outside of the dogma, you get attacked. Yeah. You know, I've had people say that about uh, not all, not all groups like that, but some groups, that's what some of my clients have reported is, is yeah. not feeling that they could be, you know, and, and so I think it's kind of important to break down the dogma and, and say, you know, your non-monogamy is custom made. There's, right. there's certain, we want it to be safe, sane and consensual. We want it to be, eth you know, uh, kind and compassionate and ethical, but beyond that, you know, it should be custom made. And I guess it's an argument on what is ethical, right. you know? Yeah. Right. It I feel like that's one of the bigger ongoing conversations is what exactly is right now. There's a really hot meme going around about, um, you know, uh, just showering a new, a new person with love every three months while you ghost everybody else over and over and over and over again, isn't right. actually ethical. And I think that's, I think ready for polyamory. I can't, uh, Laura Boyle, I think she's the one that, that wrote that down and it's popping around. I'm like, great example. To me, that one's a clear, that's not ethical, but the, the trying to determine what ethical is actually becomes one of the dogmatic points that then people get stuck on too. So mm -hmm. it's, I, I feel like we can get, we can get trapped in the, um, in just trying to describe what we're doing so mm -hmm. much that we forget to actually just be in our relationships or at least I have well, found that. You know, to happen. You know I, I, I think doing non-monogamy well really does take a heavy dose of kind of Buddhist philosophy and non-attachment, you know, uh, and uh, allowing 
uh, realizing that metaphorically, if we did a metaphor of life, it's like standing in front of a stream that everything's going by, you know, the beautiful fishy, the kind of ugly tin can, and we don't get to keep any of it, including our own life. And so the partners that we have, we cannot control them. But with that being said, you know, I think part of the problem is within non-monogamy is that we do have that love language of carefree, fun, freedom, and adventure, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of us. And so the last thing, if you want to piss off a a non-monogamous people, a live person, a lot of it is, you know, like one way to piss off a non-monogamous person is to make them feel controlled in any way. Right. (laughs) But, right. But at the end of the day, if you think about a healthy relationship, if we boil it down to a couple of people who are non-monogamous and there's other lovers out here, but let's just talk about them for simplicity. Um, What I see is, is healthy is, you know, that this person has their friends and their life and their independence. And this person has their friends and their life and their independence, but then there's the couplehood the Venn diagram crossover, and that needs to be healthy too. So in other words, we're balancing freedom with self-care. And sometimes people fear that if I list any kind of self-care needs, then I'm being controlling. And often they might be uh, accused of being controlling. And it's really hard to find that balance between freedom and self-care. And I think that's where a lot of the ethical arguments happen. Yep. I, I really appreciate the way you just juxtaposed freedom with self-care versus um, freedom with security or stability. I I know that you talk, you talk beautifully about stability, but self-care sort of goes beyond that into like, well, what would it, what would care look like for you right now? And that's also, it's more flexible to my mind. Um, Mm -hmm. But I, I would love, you were reading, Ken was reading the book and really got captured by the stability section, the, the, when you're talking about creating stability. And I would yeah, love for I, you to ask your question. Um, say more about what you said in the book. The, um, the st- so from where I come from, my particular, how I enter into relationships, um, different people are looking for a different level of stability in their relationships. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I'm a fan of stability, generally speaking. And I, I also the the freedom, self care, stability, I feel like they're, they're all in there. Um, So I like a little, you know, like a little bit of freedom, a little bit of self care and, and the stability of saying, what are we doing? And um, how much do we talk about what we're doing? Uh, Mm -hmm. And so you had, you had a list of things that you felt was um, like the 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 underpinnings of stability in a relationship. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Oh, let's see. I'm not quite sure what you're referencing right now. I'm sure I did. But um, I think you'd have to give me a little bit more. um, uh, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, let's see. The... um, (laughs) I mean, I can toss something out there. I know that I talked about stability through a lot of different lenses. Like okay. say, say yeah. someone who is anxious, like there are people that have anxiety that they, one of their self-care needs is for their partner, say, to tell them when they're going to come home from seeing mm. another lover or something like that to, to the person dating the anxious person, very often they feel controlled. Right. Uh, very often the anxious person is, they're not trying to be controlling. They're just trying to manage their anxiety. That is no joke, but you know, but that can be, uh, you know, and both people have their points, right. You know, and that right. gets tricky to tr- figure out how to balance that ethically, but on the side of the person with anxiety, if they don't know kind of in a window of when their partner is coming home from a lover, they may literally have a panic attack. Like this is not a, this, this is not the, um, how should I say being petty or something, yeah. you know? And so for them, that is a self-care ask, right? you know? Yeah. And so for them, that is, that is an anchor of stability, you know, for someone else, they might not, you know, there's, you know, I, I talk about in the book, how a, a, a rigid relationship model versus, you know, a, a more open fluid a uh, flexible model is not, and neither model is inherently bad or good. It's, it's how it operates, you know? 
Yeah. Um, you know, I've known people that have been non-monogamous for a long time with high emotional intelligence. And it's like taking off the training wheels on the tricycle, you know, it, it's like they, they can just see each other and read each other and they don't need a whole bunch of rules yeah. or relation. Well, rules is the wrong word, but relationship agreements. agreements. They, like, yeah, they, they can just sort of feel into the situations and it's, I, I've seen those people too. They, they come, come out and it's almost like there's a naturalness to it. Yeah. But it's, it's more of how they, how the relationship was before too. So it's, it's like an easeful right. transition, yeah. but not everybody has that. Right. And I've seen people that also, you know, say, well, I, I deserve complete freedom. And so, you know, which you do, but if you go off trying to have complete freedom in your non-monogamous triad or whatever, and people are not reading each other and they're hurting each other left, right, and, and center, it can be quite the shit storm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's the right way to yes, put it. That's... Yeah. You you're, know, you're reminding me of how, so when I think about <laughs> non-monogamy, my, my understanding of it is really, really broad, right? So I've been, I've been thinking about it for a long time. You've been thinking about this for a long time. You, you open the book and pretty soon in the, in the opening, you're talking about um, <laughs> sort of welcoming people to the idea of the fluidity of the situation, yeah. that it's not just one thing you, once you have this big vocabulary, that fluidity can feel very safe. But I find that often at the beginning, when people are just opening or they're just even discovering what all this is, that fluidity can feel destabilizing. It can feel like, right. but I just want to know the way. And yeah. I'm curious, do you, do you find that that eases over time or, you know, what, how does that show up in your practice when you're working with people? Do well, some people I'll, just come to it more easily? Well, I, I think different people have different needs within non-monogamy. Some people, you know, uh, just because of their background, maybe they are really emotionally intelligent and so are their partners and they can go into non-monogamy and literally pull it off in a very fluid way. Uh, situation with maybe, you know, where maybe they have two other partners that they live in a house with or whatever, you know? Um, but yeah, a lot of people, including myself, when I went into, uh, non-monogamy, I had had an 11 year monogamous relationship. And then when I switched, uh, and, and had a 13 year relationship and, and marriage, uh, we started out in the swing lifestyle. This was way back in 2003, you know, and so, so now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, back then, uh, for a long time, we didn't even know that the pe because, you know, the swing lifestyle has kind of a, at least at the time, they had a very strong rule about kind of like no drama that extended to not talking about politics. We yep. want to hear about your wonderful trip to Cancun. We do not want to hear about your grandma that's dying of cancer, you know? And so we yep. literally had friends that were super kind and empathetic. But later on down the road, we found out that they couldn't have been any more politically opposed to our Because it was very like boxed out. Every Like Everything. no drama meant nothing that could cause any tr tr like tension even in the space. That's what I experienced too from that like. Well, at the parties, it was just like, this is supposed to be, which was great. I was working at the time, at the time, because I was yeah. working at a clinic that was very, very intense. And to just go to a non-monogamous party that was just all joy and all happiness and wearing the costumes that, you know, the, yeah. you know, a lot of swing lifestyle, they have like a theme. So this time we're wearing rainbows, you know, and the, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, but, and, and a lot of people had very rigid models. Uh, that, and a lot of times it did work for them. I know couples that have been in the swing lifestyle for, you know, 20 years and they've always had a pretty, you know, I always joke that a lot of swing lifestyle people, it's a like, it's almost like going to an accountant convention <laughs> when you go to a hotel takeover. Like if you were to yep. talk to everybody's rule book, it'd be pretty much the same from person to person. Yep. And yep. that's not necessarily a negative thing. It's worked for a lot of folks in the swing lifestyle to know that, okay, we're sexually non-monogamous, but we're uh, romantically monogamous and all that. But then let's face it also a ri rigid model can be completely toxic and controlling right. and emotionally abusive. So. Yeah. This word control is really catching my attention. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about the way we interpret control. That's what I'm hearing you say right now is like, it's, there's control, there's overtly controlling behavior, but then there's all the behavior that our partner shows 
that can absolutely feel controlling depending on how we interpret it. Now you add a couple more partners and that I see that turn into um, a really a big opportunity for any one person to feel like like they they may feel like everybody's controlling them, especially if they're if they're not really practiced at stating what they need or setting boundaries. And I was thinking about how you um, you were talking about creating stability, but also I was thinking about, well, what about creating enough um, instability so that somebody can change and be different? And like that person who's used to being that one down position and and who keeps getting feeling controlled all of a sudden when they like put their shoulders back and they start asserting themselves, that changes the dynamic of not just one, not just one Venn diagram, but often a lot of them, like everybody Mm -hmm. in a particular polycule or whatever, everybody can feel impacted. Right. But the control, but control is the word that comes up the most frequently for me. I hear people feeling controlled, but when I, as a coach, I'm like outside of the situation, I think, is it controlling or do you feel controlled? Cause they're, they're not necessarily the same thing. And, and, and clearly, you know, just on this topic within non-monogamy, you know, a dissertation could be written, right. a, a book could be written, several books could be written, you know? Um, I think another thing to look at is we have a tendency to look in the microcosm of, of, of the people involved, but I think we have to look at the sociological level. You know, like um, if you're a woman that grew up in a really misogynistic culture um, where the misogyny that you experienced was not just with maybe someone you dated, but it was just the air you breathed in and out. And then you escaped that you may really, you know, break out in hives if somebody tries to control you. If you have like consciously become realize that and you're breaking free from it. Same thing with, with a lot of folks that have experienced racism. If they have experienced racism, abuse from cops, uh, you know, like they haven't gotten opportunities at work, blah, 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 like the rate, you know, and again, they felt like they were breathing in racism day in, day out. The chance that they will be really, uh, very hyper vigilant as soon as they feel controlled. Yeah. Is is understandable for sure. Yeah. So now I'm thinking about the context the contextualization and how uh-huh. taking into account like where each of us is. This might be one of the reasons why people are like, oh, it's mostly talking. It's less sex and we're talking <laughs> <laughs> to do a relationship this way. And to some degree that's true because we're taking into account the context that each of us has come from and the one we're creating now, it is complicated. And so that's making me think about how, how the, how theories can help some people make sense of it all. So I know you discuss attachment theory and how that, like it can help us understand why we come into this shared context. And instead of having like, Oh, good, we're all here together. And we all want it. We all, we're all in. And it actually winds up being really messy. Would you talk a little bit about how you think of attachment theory impacting non-monogamous relationships? You can yeah, take that well, any direction you like. <laughs> okay. So I'll just kind of run through a few things. You know, it, in the book, I talked uh, through the lens of the Diane Poole Heller model. And if you understand uh, attachment styles, you know, just, I think it's important for anyone listening to just know that even if you identify as say anxious, ambivalent, or, or one of these attachment styles, you are not fixed in stone. Like who you date will shift. You'll, you know, if you date someone more secure, you you'll probably shift to being more secure. And as you heal yourself across your life, the more you heal, the more you'll start to shift to being more secure. Um, One thing to keep in mind is that non-monogamy folks that are attachment injuries way more than monogamy does. So that is the blessing and the curse. And we've kind of talked about that already a little bit, you know, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's a blessing because it's an opportunity for growth, right? It's like when we realize that we're being triggered or that we are having some kind of uncomfortable feelings, we can go, oh, okay, this is something that I thought uh, was not worked through, but I, maybe I have some stuff to work on with this. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of curse to it is, is that it can be painful at times. Right. 
Um, you know, I, I think, you know, going back to the example we started with, with, you know, the, the couple that's at the party and one person isn't checking in enough or what have you, I think it's important. And this is another thing that I sometimes have a beef with, with the stuff that's out there. It's like when one person gets upset, a lot of times the advice is to go in and see what's going on with you when really there may, I think it's important to look on both sides, like what's going on with you, but has your partner done something that's disrespectful or, or something, you know, where it could be, yes. where it could be something that's, that's better. A lot of times people think they're jealous. And when I say, okay, let's unpack that because jealousy is a complex emotion with all kinds of stuff inside that suitcase. What I find out is that it's not even jealousy and it's not anything that could be jealousy. It's disrespect, oh. you know? Yep. <laughs> so, okay. I love this. We, we have to go further into it because I talk about jealousy all the time, but disrespect and the way I understand it is like, it's so easy for some people to miss it, to miss, to miss that they're feeling disrespected. And I know you said this in the book that like, if someone is missing that they're feeling disrespected, how do you help them differentiate? Like, What's what even tips you off about whether they're feeling disrespected versus jealous in a given situation? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times they have already labeled it. They're like, I'm feeling jealous because of X, Y, and Z. They've read enough non-monogamous literature to already slap that label on it. I'm like, okay, hold on. Let's back the truck up. Okay, let's unpack that. Tell me what happened. And say it's a client that I've been working with for a long time. And I know what some of their relationship agreements are. And they unpack the story and they tell me the details. And like, you just told me like three different relationship agreements that were broken. And you just told me that on the, the heels of your partner breaking all those relationship agreements, they accuse you of being jealous and started gaslighting you rather than giving you compassion. Like all of that is a package of just being disrespected. At the end of the day, it's so important to feel cherished within non-monogamy, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And that's the opposite of cherishing your partner. Yeah. It's making me think about the way it feels to be in any relationship and realize that, that we're, we're just not being seen. We're just like, we're just not being seen and a relationship agreement can make it more more visible, maybe (laughs) like theoretically your relationship agreement should make these, these places where disrespect is coming, coming up more visible. But I find that a lot of people want to have a relationship agreement. They even think they have a relationship agreement and yet push comes to shove and they're sharing their story and there's no agreement in place. Like there's not only is there no written agreement, there's no agreement. They're not agreeing on what they agreed to, in, you know, in the room now. And so then we have to really unpack what exactly are we calling an agreement now? What, like, at what right. point did you decide this is what we agreed to? And this is where I, I think you recommend writing things down. <laughs> and I do. And the reason for, for me is for self-accountability. I want to be able to hold myself accountable for whatever it was I agreed to later, because it is so easy late, later on to assume goodwill for, toward myself. Toward yourself. Yeah, I, I do that. I, yeah. I mean, um, it, 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 de- um, it depends on, <laughs> it depends on the people involved. I mean, I, again, if you um, are, you know, a really emotionally intelligent person and you're with partners where it's very intuitive and it feels easy to you and you don't have these bumps happen hardly ever, uh, despite not having the re- relationship model written down and the agreements written down, then maybe you don't need to. But if you tend to, if one of your partner has a tendency to uh, forget things, distort things, you know, yeah, that sort of thing, then it needs to be written down, you know, with, you know, just lose, you know, you can write it down with a date and then any relationship model is, um, you know, it's kind of a harm reduction model that's going to change over time. So you can write the date and where you have done little addendums and stuff like that. Right. Um, this isn't something that's in concrete, but it allows if you're having a disagreement, you can go back and, and go, now, what did we say? You know, that kind of thing. 
uh, <laughs> because you're right. What I've experienced the same thing where it's, it's, it's like, I'll, I'll say is the relationship agreements clear. And one person is like, it's completely clear. And the other person's like, it's completely unclear, you know, <laughs> right. and the two of you have worked with a lot of people in relationships and, um, how much of this this difference that you're describing, one person saying this is clear, one person saying it isn't, um, is have you how much have you dug into like so why are you doing this? Like what is it for you mm-hmm. that brings you to this kind of relationship, whether it's monogamous or non-monogamous? What do you, what are you showing up for, and therefore what are you hoping to get from the other person? And I'm asking because the times when I think I trip over our agreements most often and miss things is when I have lost track of the difference between what I'm looking for and what you're looking for. It has a lot of overlap, but then there's the, the places where we don't overlap. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just like, well, of course we're doing this because I, I, you know, because I want, because we <laughs> want more time doing this. No, that's me. And I forgot to separate us and say, this is what I want. What do you want? Yeah. 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 Uh, I see I, it. Do you, do you see that? Do you see that coming up with your clients? I definitely do. I'm just curious. Well, what you're describing, some people call it hive mind, like assuming yes. <laughs> oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're kind of almost assuming that you have a hive mind with your partner. Yeah. Um, but if there's anything that distinguishes humans from animals is our storytelling. So, you know, I've, I've just noticed um, it happens all the time where one person is saying, well, this is what I want. And, and, or, or telling some kind of story and the other person is just reinterpreting the tor- the story with their own uh, interpretation. And so even when you get really operational sometimes where you're like, you know, I would like, I would love it if you would bring me 11 roses on a Friday at midnight or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. even when you really operationally define something, uh, sometimes if you have a partner that distorts things or, or has a tendency to project things or whatever, it can behoove you to say, you know, what did you just hear? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. or if you're somebody who, you know, you have a partner where sometimes you guys miss it, you know, are not on the same page and you express something, you can always be the one to say, what did you just hear? Yeah. yeah. You know, In- inviting uh, like just good relational hygiene at that point. I mean, I have teenagers, so I have to practice that <laughs> for them all the time. <laughs> now, what did you hear? Cause I know what I just spoke, but that doesn't mean it's what was communicated. And as soon as you add the telephone game to that, because if I'm talking to Ken and then Ken needs to relay that to a partner who's not in the room. Now we've also got the added problem that there's, there's now an actual reinterpretation happening. So getting, getting clear, involves yeah revisiting and and asking for that clarity from from people yeah and i remember years ago uh reed mahalko talked about dating your species you know and so often i see clients you know they're so joyful that they found another non-monogamous partner to date and yet one person is very much looking to be in the swing lifestyle and have a whole bunch of lovers and this and that and go to parties every weekend and this person just wants one other lover and they want to be poly, or maybe they're thinking about living in a house with a whole bunch of other poly people raising a a family. And even though they love each other, they want completely different lives and they're constantly fighting. Right. You know? And so I think one choosing people that are as in alignment with you as possible is so, is so key. And then also, you know, we, again, we, we can't control another person. We're all free agents, but I think we have um, a responsibility more than a monogamous person does to choose stable partners because, you know, when we're single and we're, you know, like just a single person that's operating in a monogamous way and just dating, it's like, you can choose like maybe to date somebody who is, you know, um, maybe kind of bitchy to you, but they're amazing lover. So you're like, I'm going to put up with how a little bit of bitchiness because the sex is amazing. Yep. <laughs> if you do that with a non-monogamy, you're getting the benefit of the great sex, but all your partners are getting the secondhand smoke of this person who's cruel. Yeah. Oh, such an important mm. point. That that was one of my big lessons early on in the messy part when we really didn't know what we were doing because we didn't have language was 
Yeah, choose carefully. And we, because we had chosen to raise children together, we had to choose keeping in mind that we had a complex situation off the bat. Every single time we choose a new lover, every single time we choose to even open a dating profile again, that we're yeah. exposing a lot of people to our particular choice. And it does, I, I've had people phrase that as, you know, oh, that sounds like a buzzkill. And I think it actually has made me really intentional. I, I get really, really, really clear as quickly as I can because I, because I care about the other people I'm connected to. So in some ways it's, it's made me respect myself more because right. I'm, I'm taking into consideration everybody around me, which slows me down. It slows my role a little bit. I yeah. don't just dive in. So, which is, which is hard. I mean, you know, let's face it within non-monogamy, we have a tendency still to project our culture into our non-monogamy, you know, and you know, some of that is projecting monogamy into our non-monogamy at times. Sometimes we, we are unconsciously doing that, but we also, you know, it's, it's really hard not to uh, impose what we've seen in movies. Like movies say, you know, it can be like, you know, hot and heavy and, um, but if you just choose the right person, it'll be organic and it'll work out well. And, and, and you don't really need to discuss things if you choose, right. You know, they, our movies really send a whole bunch of, uh, distorted ideas about love and relationships and That's people sure. still want to have that love at first sight kind of experience. that's fast and furious. And it's like, it usually doesn't bode well down the, <laughs> down the chain. Right. Something I've noticed. So yeah, there's all these stories that if we took them as models and as accurate reflections of what could be, that's just disasters waiting to happen. And in a lot of in a lot of life, looking out at social media and such, there's a, there's similar things where things are are they're they're candy coated and they they look um, like well things things should be simpler and easier and more beautiful somehow. And my, my experience, limited as it is, of looking at how people are presenting non-monogamy, like intentionally, the people who are like, I want to talk about this. I haven't seen a lot of that. I haven't seen a lot of the candy coating. They're like, this is hard. This requires like attention and care of the people around me. And I, I've seen a lot of those messages, which I really like to see. That's good, uh, and yeah. I, it is, I appreciate that, that you are another voice who has put out a book. So that people can read directly what what's going on and what they could do and, and how how this could be without telling them how it should be, for one thing. And right. uh, I just think that's great. And thank you. Oh, oh, you're welcome. And, and you know, the fact that in the past within non-monogamy, uh, there was a lot of cheerleaders kind of like, you know, there was you know, now we're kind of being more honest about the mm -hmm. whole range of what non-monogamy can be, that it can be amazing and joyous and fun, but it can also be really freaking hard and poke at all our attachment injuries. But there was a time where a lot of the people that were speaking on it were kind of waving their pom-poms. Yes, they would talk about jealousy, but they were waving their pom-poms. And, and again, it's like, you know, it's understandable given that, like, if you look at any group that has received a lot of bigotry, whether it's a particular race or a particular religious group, because the world is coming down on them, they're the only ones to wave their pom poms. So sometimes they're they're slow to reveal the challenges that are going on. And sure. I think you know, within non-monogamy, you know, I, I've seen the studies. I, I'm not sure what they would say now, but I've read studies where monogamous people were asked the question: Are non-monogamous people less hygienic? than yeah. monogamous people. And a huge percentage of people said, yes, they're less hygienic. They're literally more dirty physically. Right. Yeah. And so that really compels somebody to want to wave their pom-poms. But I think now it's been so out and everything that we're ready to talk about the whole range. Yeah. Oh, okay. That brings me to a great spot. I, I figured out what I wanted to ask you to close out the interview, which is, would you share with us something that has been really profoundly like a great learning moment for you in your own experience of trans, especially be, being monogamous for a long time and then not what's been one of the big learns for you? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, as I said, I, I started being non-monogamous in 2003 and from the time I was, you know, my grandfather was head of the educational psych department of the university of Alabama. So it's 
you know, psychology, I was being taught psychology from the time I was a little girl, I was being taught to track my body on some level from the time I was a little girl, but I never had really applied it to non-monogamy. And so, um, so I was in my head a lot for a lot of reasons, uh, you know, being 53 in the generation I grew up in, I grew up with watching Spock on Star Trek. Again, a lot of it is internal, <laughs> internalized misogyny that says something like man, logical, good woman, emotional, bad. And so, you know, you get that message that you are being inferior if you're not up in your head, mm -hmm. you know? And so I was so good at that, you know, and I also was an overgiver. So I didn't want to be that controlling person. Mm -hmm. And so all of that was a cocktail that led me to being so good at being in my head that even if I had a negative feeling coming up, it literally was suppressed in my body and emotionally before it even reached my consciousness. Yeah. And so when I took um, the course uh, through the Trauma Resiliency Institute, the Trauma Resiliency Model, uh, and really got back to thinking about tracking my body, I started to track my body. I started to use my mind, my body, and my emotions from a grounded, centered place as my full compass. Mm. And as soon as I started doing that, um, I really started to either consent or not consent to things from a honest place. I didn't know I was being dishonest to myself before, but I was. And so as soon as I started to really be honest, because I was really listening to my whole system, mm. then what I started asking for, what I started to create and build completely shifted. And I literally felt like I aged backwards 10 years during that time. Wow. Ken had almost exactly the same <laughs> response. Like Ken used to describe himself right, when I first right to the him, right to the I, to idolatry of Spock. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that you say that, it's, and and specifically that it was like it, it's like it gives you back access to your yeah. some of your life force yeah. to to integrate this these parts that get disowned so easily when we're not really speaking our truth in our relationships. Well, it's a, it's a lot about patriarchy. And when, please hear me. Mm -hmm. When I say patriarchy, I'm not saying man bad or anything. I, I love, I love all genders. I'm not saying that, but patriarchy does, you know, it puts men in this tight little man box. It puts women in this tight little uh, woman box. And it says there's no genders in between. So it's so claustrophobic it cuts us off from our total humanity and when we decide to blow that shit up and allow ourselves to have the full range of being you know giving ourselves sexual range creative range that you know like men are told you you get to wear your dockers and you get to wear the, your little man suit and and if you wear anything beyond that then you're some word that's deemed horrible within patriarchy right like when right. you blow that shit up, then for the first time in your life, you get to be a full human. Right. And it sounds like your experience was that to some degree, non-monogamy helped build, even though you already had a grounding in knowing yourself, then it, it leveled that up again. And I, yeah, I mean, not only am I glad for you, but I'm glad because I think that one more model of, yep non-monogamy can be one of the ways that we come to know who we are mm -hmm. as a person, whether that yeah. winds up being a forever choice or even just an exploration that doesn't, isn't your forever choice. I, it's up to you, but I'm really grateful to hear that story. Yeah. I mean, it's like what uh, Megan on Amory podcast says, she describes non-monogamy as a spiritual journey. Right. right. And I think it can be if you're you know, working on your emotional intelligence, you are choosing kind partners and you're, you have a tribe that's compassionate to themselves and others. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. So I know that our listeners are going to want to get a hold of your book. Absolutely. And we will link it in the show notes, but would you tell everyone where to find your work out in the world? Yeah. So it's open deeply, a guide to conscious, compassionate, open relationships. You can find it wherever books are sold. If you decide you want to get the paper back, please support our local bookstores out here in LA. You know, you got Skylight Books and, and, you know, Book Soup, and there's quite a few, um, but you can get it in all three forms, paperback, Kindle, um, and Audible. 
Um, so, you know, and you can get it on Amazon if that's the way you want to go, but, um, there are a lot of lovely independent bookstores where you can get it as well. I love that, Kate. Thank you so much for writing the book, for joining us today. I am really, really grateful for your work in the world and for, for offering this resource, because I I really do think it speaks to what's possible if people really dig in and and do the work and, and enjoy it. You wrote a book that can't can be about enjoying doing the work of opening up. And I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. And thank you for doing the amazing work that the both of you are doing. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Awesome. There's no one right way to design your relationship. And lots of people, actually about 25%, according to a recent national survey, are interested in some type of open relationship. But how do you know if you are ready to open up happily? Not everyone is, and that's no problem. I've got a 60 second quiz that will give you the answer. And even better, you'll walk away with your next step, whether you're good to go or not so much when it comes to opening up. And this is no BuzzFeed nonsense. I personally designed this quiz from my years of academic research. Go to joliquiz.com. That's J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com. And find out if you're ready to open up happily and what to do if you are or if you're not. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J O L I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable sex, love, losses, and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast, out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. 